Greetings and blessings. I am so grateful for the opportunity to share from the theology of the body by applying it to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to St. Joseph. I want to begin just by highlighting a couple of preliminary thoughts. First of all, we find ourselves in the year of St. Joseph as a result of Pope Francis decreeing in Patris Corde that we are going to celebrate from the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 8, 2020, to one year later. And I also want to pinpoint some of the features or highlights in that important document because he's focusing on St. Joseph as a beloved father. The next section is a tender, loving father, and then an obedient father, an accepting father, a creatively courageous father, that's my favorite, a working father, a father in the shadows. And of course he goes on, but I think what we recognize is the great need to recover a model of fatherhood. And Joseph is that and much more. But I would like to shift from fatherhood to the role of St. Joseph as husband, the husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in particular, what I'd like to do is to draw some lessons from the Holy Family in order to see how Joseph viewed Mary. More particularly, how did Joseph view the body of Mary? A second preliminary thought that I think we should touch upon, and that is the lessons that we draw from the theology of the body. Because we know that our culture has a love-hate relationship with the body because on the one hand, they indulge it too much, and on the other hand, they react by showing contempt for it. They treat it as though it's just an instrument or a wrapper, a compartment, you know, a, a, a carton or something that is meant to be tossed away and all of that. But we know better. We know that the body is an essential part of what it means to be human. The body is a visible sign of the soul. The soul is the form of the body. But even more than that, the body is an, a sacrament of nature. A body is, our bodies are sacraments of the person. And so there are sacraments of the new law. There are also sacraments of the old law. But even prior to the Mosaic ceremonies, there were sacraments of nature. What is a sacrament? A visible sign of an invisible reality. What else is it? Well, it's a sign that causes what it signifies. So water is a sacrament of nature because it signifies cleansing, it signifies life, but it also cleanses and gives life. The body is like that. And so when we recognize how God made man in the image and likeness of God, male and female, we recognize that the image and likeness of God does not only apply to the soul through the intellect that knows and the will that chooses to love, but through the body and the soul. And so the body that is male, in the case of Adam, is a sacrament of the soul which loves the body of the bride, but also loves Eve as a person. And I could go on. But I want to shift gears by taking the thoughts of Pope Francis on St. Joseph and taking the lessons from Pope St. John Paul II on the theology of the body and how the body is the sacrament of the person and the means by which we make the gift of self. I want to apply that to the Holy Family in general, but especially to St. Joseph. How did Joseph see Mary? How did he view her body? Now, I mean, we could say a few things that would be proper expressions of Catholic piety, that she, that she was beautiful, that he was attracted to her, but even more that he was consecrated to her. Long before St. Louis de Montfort, you might say that St. Joseph was the first to engage in this commitment known as true consecration, you know, and so he was not only the first to be consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary long before St. Louis de Montfort, he made that consecration, he lived it, it practically defined his life. I would also say this, that there is a proper way we might understand St. Joseph as the first Mariologist. Not only did he exercise Marian devotion, but he was given the grace of understanding the Blessed Virgin Mary, not only as his bride and as the mother of our Lord, but also 
as the one through whom God would bring fulfillment to all of these promises that go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 3.15, where the woman and her seed would crush the head of the serpent. There is a new Eve, and that's who she is. There is a new Adam. Now, could he formulate this in terms of doctrinal propositions? I doubt it. But we know that the Immaculate Conception did not occur in 1854 when the dogma was defined, just as she was not assumed into heaven in 1950. No, the church formulates these propositions that we call doctrine or dogma in order to capture what was known by the faithful in the supernatural intuition of faith, which always has only one proper object, and that is Christ, the Word incarnate, but not coming down to earth as a soloist just to do his thing in isolation. No, to do it in a family. And the Holy Family is more than just a trio. The Holy Family is a spiritual organism, but it's also physical. And so we have to recognize that at some level, even though it might have been very deep and unconscious, Joseph knew he hadn't just found the perfect bride, he had found the perfect woman. Whether he could articulate that in terms of the new Eve and her immaculate conception, or the Ark of the Covenant and her eventual assumption, or the fact that she's the queen mother. I mean, these are the typologies that we find for example, in John, the new Eve, we find in Luke, the Ark of the New Covenant. In Matthew 1, we find the queen mother of the son of David. And I don't think he could have given a theological lecture that would, you know, start off a course on Mariology. But the fact is, well, Christ saves us, not Christology. And so while it's helpful to learn Christology and the grammar of Christological doctrine in order to articulate and express our faith in Christ with precision, Nevertheless, it's not the same thing as being bound in a deep covenant of love with Jesus Christ or with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so I want to just pause and then just shift tracks so that we can move from the Mariological and move into life in the Holy Family, especially in Nazareth. I want to just point out what should be obvious, but I think sometimes because of Catholic devotion and piety, all of which is not only proper, but powerful and healthy, that uh, we, we have the Blessed Virgin in art, in beautiful paintings, in statues, in icons, and so on. And I mean, that is, well, thank God for all of those gifts. But I also want to propose that we can look at Marian art, whether it's a statue or an image or a painting, and begin the preliminary journey of how it was that Joseph viewed the Blessed Virgin. How did he see her body? Because her body was the bride of St. Joseph. I mean, she was not just a holy soul conceived without original sin. She was a gorgeous woman. She was beautiful. And I have no doubt in my mind that St. Joseph found himself strongly attracted to this beautiful woman. Now, I'm not going to delve into, you know, the, the mysteries of Josephology that are sometimes debated in Spain and Italy and elsewhere, you know. Let's assume that he didn't receive the grace of the Immaculate Conception. Let's assume that he had to achieve, through the grace of God, growing dominion over concupiscence, huh? that he had to achieve self-mastery. And so when it came to the beautiful body of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he would see her beauty. He would see that she's gorgeous. He would be strongly attracted. He would also notice her humility. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. He would catch the, the modesty of her dress and all of the rest. But that would not diminish her attractiveness. If anything, her virtue coupled to her beauty, the soul and the body of this person would have been irresistible to St. Joseph. The perfect means for a man to overcome the dominion of concupiscence, to put it in terms that we draw from St. John Paul II. But it wasn't just her body. It would be her face. You know, I must admit that what I find most beautiful in Kimberly are her eyes. You know, we, we call the eyes the windows of the soul. And my wife is so virtuous. She is so uh, joyful. She is so positive. You know, I don't want to embellish and make it seem as though she's perfect, but Mary was. <laughs> and so when St. Joseph would look into her eyes, he would look through the windows of her soul 
and recognize that the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You could come up with the titles of New Eve, Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the New Covenant, Queen Mother, and all of the rest, and that's proper. But he would go beyond the labels. He would go beyond the words and see the person. And who is she? She's my bride. She is my sister. She is the beloved daughter of God. She is daughter Zion, and she is gorgeous and beautiful. On their wedding day, to be sure, off the charts, but every day as well. Another thing that I find remarkably irresistible about Kimberly is her smile. I think in some ways it's the center of the beauty of a woman's body. The fact that she has that energy of love flowing from her eyes, but then that smile. When I come home or when we you know, get together, we're going out on a date tonight. You know, I know I'm going to see that smile and it lights up my life and it's always lit up the lives of our family members as well. But there are other body parts to a woman that Joseph undoubtedly found attractive. Mary's breasts are the beauty of a woman. And of course, we recognize that with her beautiful breasts, she would nurse the Son of God, but also the Son of Joseph. And just as I recall what it was like to go through Kimberly's birthing of our firstborn, Michael, 30 hours of labor, and then eventually a cesarean section. And, you know, suddenly there is this lesson that comes to a man that discovers what we already knew, but we didn't really appreciate, and that is what those beautiful body parts are really for. Not just as an attractive bride, but as a fruitful mother. Not just to bear the embryo, but to birth the infant and then to nurse him as well. And so these are the beautiful aspects of her body, but also her waist, her hips, her legs, her arms, her hands, her fingers. I bet you they held hands and not infrequently. And so when we look at how it was that he would be with her every day, presumably, you know, he would wake up together, they would have breakfast, they would go to sleep together. You know, I, I want to propose that the body is not only a sacrament of the person, but draw from the truth that St. Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, that the body is a holy temple. And no one's body was holier than the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so there is this natural attraction, this natural union. And though it was chaste and celibate by really a set of vows, they weren't just exchanging vows for marriage, from Luke, we learned that they had to have exchanged mutual vows for consecrating their own celibacy. The early church called that a Josephite marriage. And so he gave heartfelt consent fully and freely to their marriage, but also to the consecration of themselves as celibate too. I mean, that's a mystery that we can talk about later on perhaps. But I just want to reflect upon how it was that we can learn that same lesson. I have a book called Joy to the World, How Christ Coming Changed Everything and Still Does. And I focus in this chapter called The Glory of Your People, the presentation, on the presentation of the child Jesus after 40 days, but also of the second rite, the ritual of her purification. And I want to draw briefly from pages 132 and 133 from this book, and I think you'll see why in a moment. There was a second rite required 40 days after a child was born, and that one was prescribed for the mother. The law required the child's mother to offer sacrifice for the sake of purification after childbirth. This does not mean, as most modern readers sometimes misunderstand this passage, that the law of Moses considered sex or womanhood or childbirth to be dirty or sinful. No, on the contrary. Just as the priest had to purify the holy vessels every time they were used in the temple liturgy, after pouring wine libations, for example, or after splashing sacrificial blood upon the altar, so a woman who gave birth also had to be purified following the holy use of her sacred body in giving birth to a new child. Purification at once acknowledges the holiness of the vessel and renews that holiness so that it can once again carry out God's sacred purposes. So after the vessels are purified, they may be used again by the priests in the sacred liturgy. 
After 40 days, the woman's body is purified so that she too can be used for holy purposes. Now, because of their marriage and also because of their, their exchange of vows of this chastity, of the Josephite celibacy, the holy use would have been being a bride still and being a mother, obviously. But I think we usually just default to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we forget the fact that she was also still the beloved bride of Joseph. And she would see in him her beloved bridegroom. And so I think it's important to recognize how they would see each other, and not just spiritually and supernaturally, but physically and naturally, because there is a physical side to being spiritual. There is a natural way to be supernatural. You know, and there is a splendor in the ordinary that invisibly communicates the extraordinary. And so they would go to bed together. So you would see the Blessed Virgin Mary, my beloved bride, getting ready for bed, exhausted, at peace, finishing up the prayers. But at times, I suspect you would look and see in the Blessed Virgin, if you were Joseph, that there is an anxious moment or, or two. There are days of anxiety when you're fleeing Bethlehem to go to Egypt or when you're looking for the child Jesus who's been lost for three days. But there's also seeing the Blessed Virgin on her knees in prayer, praising God, pleading with God, perhaps for the innocents or for the people in Egypt, and also thanking God, not only for the gift of her child, the Lord Jesus Christ, but for the gift of St. Joseph, her beloved bridegroom, who must have been handsome, who must have been attractive to her. She must have taken delight not only in St. Joseph's sanctifying soul, but also in his body as a man. And then Joseph would see Mary at work, preparing the meals, cleaning up after those meals, but also changing the diapers and perhaps asking Joseph to help with that as well. Planning her day, being flexible, because I remember Kimberly with our firstborn, you know, and how you'd have a plan A for the day, but before noon, you were already on plan X, Y, and Z. You know, you were just having to be flexible all of the time with a newborn. Perhaps my favorite is just viewing Mary in conversation with Joseph, how that was an ongoing conversation. There was a silence in the Holy Family, I suspect, and as Cardinal Seurat reminds us, that there is a power in silence. But it isn't as though you suspend love just to focus on God. No, the silence actually can bring a couple more closely together as much as conversation. But this conversation would have been listening to her, hearing her heart, and at the same time responding with sincerity, with humility, with gratitude, but with love, devotion, trust, and respect. It took me years to learn these lessons. I mean, I loved her. I was devoted to her. But I mean, I was also in competition with my bride. For years, without even telling myself, she was decoding my own heart on that point. But I remember after several years finally looking at her after we had this stupid disagreement, and I said to her, you know what? I have never gone wrong trusting you. And I have never gone right distrusting you, even if I could prove that you were wrong. It was a lose-lose situation. Whereas when I trust you, it's always the case that even if you are wrong in some ways, you're always right for me. And I suspect that they didn't have to go through years of tension like Kimberly and I did. I suspect that they might have also been intense, though, in their work, in their play, you know, and hanging out with their little baby and as he's growing up and all of that kind of thing. But the conversation, I think, would also... I mean, even if you couldn't make out the words because they're speaking in Hebrew, I suspect that you could sense the respect that they held, that they had for each other, and, and sense the trust and the respect, the love and the devotion. But there would have been just ordinary conversation about current events, about the neighbors, you know, about Herod, about uh, the weather and that sort of thing. And small talk with love and devotion, trust and respect can also communicate large love. And that's what was going on every day. And so Mary was a full-time mother, but she was also a full-time bride. And I think we have to reflect upon the fact that their interaction, which was so often deeply spiritual, in fact, it was always deeply spiritual, was also profoundly physical. And that's a model for us as well. 
So he would see her body from the beginning when they were betrothed. In the birth of Jesus, oh my goodness, the power of the Most High did overshadow her. And this is the Son of God. But then at the presentation, her body is like the temple of God. Her, her body is a holy vessel, and it has been used for a holy purpose, and so it's going to be purified for the ongoing task of rearing our child, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, the Son of Joseph, but it's also for the holy purposes of being, being a wife. And so I would propose that, you know, the images that we have in statues or in paintings or in icons, you know, these only go so far. They go pretty far, especially the, the classical sacred art of the Blessed Virgin and St. Joseph. But I think we've got to look through the images and recognize that the artwork only goes so far. It, it begins to capture the beauty of the Blessed Virgin as God saw her, but also as St. Joseph saw her. But I think we have to recognize that when their eyes met, he saw something more than the artists, even the greatest artists saw. Because, I mean, what he sees is God's holy masterpiece, not just as the vessel, the mother of God, but as my beloved bride. And that love just kept growing. And so when their eyes would meet, they would sense that love that God had planted and elevated and supernaturally intensified as they grew up, as you know, as, the, as they grew older together. But I also would propose that they kissed. And I'm not sure I've ever seen that in artwork, but you know, when Paul refers to the holy kiss, I think there were no kisses holier. But that doesn't mean that they must have been devoid of passion. No, it must have been holy passion. As Joseph is learning through the Holy Spirit with the help of his own son, Jesus, but through the Blessed Virgin Mary, he is gradually gaining complete and holy dominion over concupiscence. Thank God for that. But not just a holy kiss, and not just every once in a while. I suspect they kissed on a frequent basis, and a holy embrace as well, where he would not only see the beauty of her body, he would feel it tenderly, and he would sense that love that she had for him that was so deep and tender. I can also see them holding hands as they walk through the neighborhoods of Nazareth. There's nothing wrong with any of this. There's something profoundly right. I suspect they laughed together. I suspect they cried together. I suspect they prayed together. They sang together. They certainly shared meals together. They ate and they slept and they did life together in concrete everyday, in concrete everyday ways as well. Uh, I think they took walks. I think they cleaned house. I think they entertained guests. You know, I think they would visit neighbors, you know, and not just Elizabeth down there near Jerusalem, but I think that they probably were quite neighborly as well. All of these things, but also hardships, you know, fleeing Bethlehem to Egypt, coming back again, but going all the way to Nazareth. They shared the frustration. They shared the sorrow. They shared the anger. They shared the anxiety over their son who was lost for days. And don't get me started about the pilgrimages. You know, it's 90 miles from Nazareth all the way down to Jerusalem. And Joseph, as an Israelite male, had to do that three times a year for Passover, then for Pentecost, and then for the week-long Feast of Tabernacles. And I suspect that the Blessed Virgin Mary accompanied him most of the time with their child. And we only catch a glimpse there in Luke 2 of the hardship, but there was a caravan, an entourage, hundreds, possibly over a thousand people coming from the north in Galilee down to the south. And, you know, you weren't sure exactly what you would be eating or drinking, where you would be sleeping. You went from town to town. You were hoping that there might be a hospitable synagogue with the rabbi who would allow you to pray and then also allow you into the hostel. They had a second compartment for the pilgrims to sleep in. But, I mean, this was hard. And you would be afraid, especially if you faced bad weather. And so all of the everyday sorrows, all of the everyday challenges, they faced and they did so, not just with this holy courage, but with a, a certain humanness. And so they were exhausted, or they were anxious, or they were, but they were always grateful. 
They were always prayerful. They were always growing in holiness like no others. But they were always modeling for us why it is that in everyday family life, we find God. Why did God become man? Because he wants for us more than we want for ourselves. Why did God become man by becoming an infant, a child, an adolescent? I mean, for 30 years, the God-man was living with Mary and Joseph for as long as he lived. Come on, Lord, with all due respect, get on with redemption. Get started with your public ministry. Why aren't you, why aren't you in, engaging in the work of salvation? If we were to ask him any of those questions, I think he'd wink and he'd nod and say, trust me, I am moving on with the work of redemption. Because redemption is not just the public ministry, the teaching, the preaching, the healing, the deliverance, the suffering, the dying, and the rising. It's family life. It's not just what we're redeemed from, sin, death, guilt, and damnation. It's what we're redeemed for. And that is sharing Christ's own sonship in the family of God that we call the Catholic Church. But also sharing family life with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. No wonder when we walk into a parish, it's a Catholic custom for there to be a tabernacle in the center where our Lord Jesus is, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the risen King of Kings. And on the left, we have an image of the Blessed Virgin. And on the right, an image or a statue of St. Joseph. Huh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. What a coincidence. No, every parish on earth is a kind of heavenly outpost of the Holy Family which was there in Nazareth. We're coming home. We're offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, but we're also enjoying sacrificial communion because the Eucharist is this heavenly banquet, this holy sacrifice, but it's also a family meal. I want to be careful not to reduce it to that, but I also want to be careful not to forget that element as well. Because when we go home, every meal is a thank offering. Every meal is an opportunity for the sacrifices of our labor to flow into a domestic liturgy. Does that mean every time we gather as the Han family, we're the Holy Family? Heck no, you know, but we have a model and not just some ethereal ideal, but a concrete historical reality. And thank God that Pope Francis put, back, put into that Eucharistic prayer, not only blessed Mary, but blessed Joseph, her spouse, because that's who he is, even still. You know, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be married or given in marriage like Jesus explained, but they are still married. And thank God, because that becomes the supernatural vortex of the family life that makes us God's sons and daughters, even more than I was a son of Fred and Molly Lujan. This is who we are as Catholics. This is where we go when we head to Mass. And this is what every parish is called to be and every family as a domestic church is also called to be. Let's go to our Lord now in gratitude. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. But we also wish to express our gratitude for St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary, that this holy family was not only intact back then, but still is now that our dysfunctional families are being healed by the love that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph have for each other and for all of us. Help us, O Lord. Heal us in our hearts and in our homes and through our families to our neighborhoods as well, to our parishes and to the diocese and to the whole world. And dear Father, hear us as we pray that family prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, most chaste spouse of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank you very much for the honor and the privilege of sharing with you today. 
I ask for your prayers and I just send God's blessings to you. Take care.